dear old participants today, as, generally sec as General Secretary of My Right, I'm very proud to welcome all of you to this launch of My Rights Report, Peace for All, Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities in Peacebuilding. This is My Rights' second project in the area of disability and armed conflict. When we implemented the first project, a seminar on this topic, we realized that there is very little research done and very little information available uh, on these subjects and on related subjects. In this particular project, we have focused on two of my rights program countries, Sri Lanka and Bosnia and Herzegovina, two countries with ongoing peace building work. And we launched the two country reports last week. And I would say that even though there are differences between the situations in the two countries, the main problem is the same in both, the lack of inclusion. Inclusion of persons with disabilities and of organizations with persons with disabilities. A lack that definitely needs to be addressed. And one important way to take a step in that direction is to increase the awareness among those working on peace building projects, be it directly, or indirectly, like donor agencies. This report is my right way of contributing somewhat to this situation. And I am very grateful to see so many representatives here today from different types of organizations. Before we start the actual launch, I would like to thank all of the organizations and individuals in Bosnia and Herzegovina in Sri Lanka and elsewhere who have contributed to this report, to these reports, I should say. Also, Leila Hadzimesic in Bosnia and Herzegovina and all those at MDF Training and Consultancy in Sri Lanka who were both, all of them, involved in the production of the reports. And last, but definitely not least, I want to thank all the staff at my right who have been involved in this work. This includes Binasa and her colleagues at the office in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Asanga and his colleagues at the office in Sri Lanka, and finally, Ingela and Sandra, who have both been instrumental in this work, both in the production of the reports and the organization and the organizing of this launch seminar, of all these three launch seminars, I should really say, and I cannot, um, underline enough how important they have been. So thank you all for being here today. And now I'll give the floor back to Ingela. Thank you. Thank you, Jesper. Um, I will try to share my screen here. Um, so now I will present uh, a bit of the, uh, first of all, overall purpose and also key conclusions that we have in this study at the international level. Um, so the study was, ha has been implemented as an international study project uh, during one year, uh, and it was funded by the Swedish uh, peace uh, building agency Folke Bernadot Academy. Um, the aim of the study has been to facilitate uh, uh, access to knowledge on policies, strategies, uh, approaches on inclusion of persons with disabilities in peace building, uh, also to gather and present the views and perspectives and the needs and interests of disability partner organizations and their members on how they perceive the level of inclusion in peace processes. And finally, to provide recommendations to UN agencies and other uh, and national and international stakeholders involved in peace building uh, on how to also meaningfully engage uh, persons with disabilities and consider their needs, uh, their rights, needs and perspectives in these initiatives. Um, 
the study was implemented uh, with a global mapping of policy and practice, and this is presented in further detail in our international report. Um, we also conducted mini case studies of uh, Colombia, Lebanon, and Ukraine. Uh, and these countries were selected um, based on consultations with the few key experts in the inception phase of the study who recommended us to focus um, uh, on Colombia and Ukraine when it comes to potential interesting best uh, practices. And then we late, a bit later into the mapping process, we identified Lebanon as an, another interesting context where the disability movement has been uh, rather involved in the anti-war and anti-violence uh, campaigns uh, dating back more than 20, 30 years. Um, and then, um, as has already been mentioned, we conducted more detailed country case studies of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Sri Lanka with the help of uh, consultants and our two uh, country offices in these two countries. So our first uh, main conclusion is that uh, persons with disabilities have not been meaningfully engaged in national and international level peace building processes that have been reviewed in this study. And this has been expressed not only by uh, our own partner organizations consulted in the two uh, uh, detailed country case studies, but also uh, expressed widely by um, OPDs uh, in, through secondary sources in, in, in other contexts. Um, so not only have they not been uh, meaningfully engaged, but also feel that they have um, a rather limited uh, knowledge uh, about the key concepts of peace building, justice and reconciliation. And also, um, to some extent, they feel that they have been, uh, since uh, persons with disabilities uh, do not have their basic needs and rights, rights fulfilled. Some uh, express also that they do not have the possibility to engage in these issues because they need first to secure uh, their basic uh, needs and human rights. Um, we have also found uh, that uh, there is a high prevalence of uh, disabilities in conflict affected countries but few peace agreements include such references. We uh, identified um, an international study published in, in 2019, uh, going through all uh, peace agreements uh, that have been signed uh, today, to date. And uh, this report states that only 6.6% .6 of all uh, peace agreements globally have uh, specific references to persons with um, disabilities. And one of these few agreements that do have specific provisions for persons with disabilities is the peace agreement signed in 2016 between uh, the Colombian government and FARC. Uh, and that was also a main reason why we did uh, select Colombia as one of the mini case studies. But uh, despite this fact, it was um, challenging to identify specific programs and projects that have persons with disabilities as a main target group or a main focus. Uh, another main conclusion is the lack of data on persons with disabilities. And this uh, challenge is of course larger in conflict and post-conflict uh, countries. And it's not only about the general level of data on, on, the, on persons with disabilities as a whole, but also a lack of disaggregated data on gender or types of disabilities. And this also, of course, has a negative impact on how the international community can plan its uh, initiatives in an inclusive uh, way in these countries. We have seen a progressive policy development, which has contributed to increased uh, focus on, on persons with disabilities within the international community. Uh, and this positive development has been noted larger within the developed sector, I would say since the 1980s, but specifically to peace building, it was uh, marked specifically through the adoption of uh, the Security Council resolution 
uh, 2475 on uh, protection of persons with disabilities and armed conflict. And also in 2019, when the uh, UN adopted its uh, disability inclusion strategy, which, uh, for, which is applicable to all areas of uh, uh, the United Nations, including peace building. And we have found that uh, while there are uh, the larger institutions, as I mentioned, in the United Nations, the World Bank, and also the European Union have uh, at least an institutional commitment through institutional strategies on, on, on inclusion of persons with disabilities, there are very few CSOs that have similar frameworks. And this lead them to tend to focus more on vulnerable groups uh, in, in broader terms, uh, rather than um, having specific engagements for persons with disabilities. Um, a main concern among our partner organizations uh, and other disability uh, partner organizations is uh, the remaining uh, approach called the charity mo model or mindset towards disability, which means that persons with disabilities are not identified as, as full and, and capable participants in, in initiatives, rather they, they're seen as a vulnerable group that needs uh, aid and support. Um, we have found, and also many other studies have concluded this, which is the accessibility uh, in terms of physical accessibility and communication, uh, limited staff capacities and budgets as main barriers to inclusion of persons with disabilities within uh, international uh, development cooperation projects, and that includes peace building. Um, so, the, the member organizations or partner organizations specifically consulted in Sri Lanka and Bosnia and Herzegovina this described many examples of venues or uh, way, the way organizations communicated, um, uh, for example, uh, grant, the, the possibility of uh, grant applications uh, was not you know, accessible uh, to their specific needs and rights as persons of disabilities and also um, the international community uh, often um, spoke of budget limitations in although they wanted to ensure persons with disabilities in their programs and projects the budgets did not always allow for them to do that in 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 a way that they wanted to uh, and there was also inflexibility in in these budgets so once um, once projects were approved, it was very difficult to add such resources in afterhand. And the, the recommendations I will not go through now, but rather after uh, the different uh, country case studies. So I will try to stop sharing and I will leave the word um, over to our. No, I'm having to our um, partner organization in, um, it is, sorry. So to the, um, I will leave the word over to our partner organization in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So Suvad from IC Lotus will uh, give the next presentation. Do we have Sandra? Yes, sorry, <laughs> just swapping headphones. Uh, yes, we do have Suvad with us. Um, Suvad, can you hear us? And if so, can you unmute? Not ask to unmute. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Now we can hear you, Suvad. Just a second. So I, I hope that you now have uh, full information uh, through uh, tone and, and picture as well. Uh, 
sorry for a small technical problem because uh, I'm uh, blind and uh, uh, I'm uh, managing my uh, Zoom without personal assistant. So uh, it might be sometime difficult for, for, for us. But anyway, uh, I want to say a few uh, general things before I start uh, to try to answer uh, on, let's say, concrete uh, questions or guide for my presentation. Uh, one is uh, rega regarding uh, my uh, English language. I'm really sorry because I'm aware that my English is worse and I'm trying again every day to make it better and better. And second, but more important, uh, I'm really proud that I get opportunity to talk about uh, so important study and so important process for uh, societies in general, but for us uh, persons with disability as a part of societies in which uh, reconciliation uh, and peace building is still actual process. So uh, almost 25 year uh, uh, past uh, after the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And still there are, uh, th there is division within the uh, society we can recognize, which is connected to the um, frontline borders and uh, processes are uh, somehow in, uh, in societies within the country are um, focused uh, on areas which are, uh, which are uh, under, uh, which are uh, on, on those, within, the, those, within those borders. But I must say that uh, we as a disability society, as a movement, uh, disability movement very fast start to learn that disability is something uh, universal as a, uh, as a, uh, as an issue and we can use it uh, to establish cooperation uh, between people between organization uh, who were during the war on different sides uh, for example, uh, we uh, uh, organization from one part of Bos Bosnia and Herzegovina, almost 1997, two years after stopping the, the war in, in a country, start to cooperate with disabled people organizations uh, from uh, other part of country, or from neighboring countries, which were uh, somehow involved in the war. So uh, we send a message to the society that cooperation is possible, that uh, somehow uh, unification among people is possible uh, due to issue they want to to, uh, to work together on and to try to, to find the solutions for group of people, which is the same, doesn't matter on which side people are living or what, what nationality they are. Because disability, as I already said, is uh, overall characteristic for all of us and universal issue which is more or less acceptable to decision makers to the to key uh, actors in a society but also uh, to us as uh, activists within the organizations or members of organization regarding the the, the study itself i must say as a as a member uh, of um, 
partner organization of human right uh, uh, of my right uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina program who have uh, experience uh, with uh, other programs as well and who uh, have uh, some uh, idea about general policies, general processes, that uh, this study is uh, really important. But uh, uh, I think uh, that it start, start little bit late because uh, more or less uh, key uh, actors within the process of peace building in our, in our country are already uh, identified and uh, uh, key donors, key stakeholders uh, invest quite a lot in a, uh, in a proce process of peace building. Uh, at the same time, uh, they don't give uh, space, they don't give opportunity uh, to marginalized groups to be involved. And uh, because of that, I, I think um, to prevent in a future such, uh, such uh, uh, situation, I think it's important that we as a disability society and as an organization who are uh, advocating for inclusion of persons with disability need to be much, much more loud. And uh, if we want to be much more loud, we must have a capacity. We, we need to develop our own capacity to consume possibility to, to be involved in a general processes in which persons with disability are very, very often excluded. So regarding, uh, regarding level of inv involvement individuals and organizations of persons with disability within the peace building process, I must say that some uh, persons with disability uh, had the opportunity to be involved in the process often, some organization as well, but many, many times we, uh, and we said that in a, in, a, in a process of consultation for a study, we don't, we, uh, we, we, will, uh, we were not aware that we contribute to the peace building process. We do our concrete projects. We, we, we do our co concrete cooperation, realize initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we, uh, we don't recognize it and we don't uh, name it as a peace building process, even it was as a such as, uh, as that. And uh, I must say that, uh, Organizations of persons with disability uh, in Bosnia uh, generally are very, very weak regarding uh, sustainability, regarding support we are getting from, from, from the state institution, state budget. And uh, due to that, just few of organization had, uh, have a capacity to, to follow mainstream processes and to raise a voice uh, of uh, persons with disability and uh, uh, provide uh, inclusion disability issues in the mainstream policies. That's not enough to, to, to prevent or to overcome this situation. I must say that we need uh, much, much more investment in a capacity building of organization uh, of persons with disability. Uh, first, if uh, some donors, some organizations want to realize project, uh, projects which are 
related to persons with disability. They need to, 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 be, uh, to become aware about capacity of organizations they want to work with or they want to involve in the process. And if the capacities are uh, in, uh, uh, inappropriate, then uh, parallelly with the project activities or as a part of project activities, they must create the, the, the program uh, for uh, raising capacity of key uh, actors of project they want to see involved. Uh, we had uh, or we have this kind of experience with my right program and that's great lessons learned which we uh, don't need to forget wherever we want to, to intervene or whatever we want to work uh, as uh, organizations of persons with disability. So um, I'm aware that my time uh, is uh, going and I just want to say uh, at the end that uh, Convention on Human Rights of Persons with Disabilities open a lot of new possibilities for organizations of persons with disability to be involved in a processes uh, interesting for, for uh, persons with disability in uh, different countries or uh, in uh, uh, different regions or regional organization. And <clears throat> Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, ratified uh, the convention almost 11 years ago. And I must say that uh, it's not case just for Bosnia, but for uh, most uh, developing countries in the world who ratified convention, it's just, uh, uh, let, let's say, formal act of recognition, such important documents and achievement in the human rights area. But more than that, uh, there is almost nothing change, changed in a life, uh, everyday life of organization of persons with disability and persons with disability. We need a uh, real change. And to achieve that real change, change we need uh, more activists, more advocates, uh, disabled people themselves involved in organization. And that is a recipe to ensure that change will happen because it's not just our job, it's our uh, life. And we can't stop at four o'clock PM. We, 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 we are living uh, 24 hours and we are advocates 24 hours. That's something really, really important to have in mind. And to uh, when we design programs, when we design support to organizations and to individuals. And then uh, what happened after the, 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 the convention uh, uh, come to the force, uh, disability become as a, a as a issue, as a social issue, become more and more popular. But at the same time, we have a, a different process when we talk about persons with disabilities and their organization. We are less and less popular, but we need to be involved and uh, space for our involvement needs to be uh, created. And that's not just upon us, that's uh, upon uh, other organizations and stakeholders to have in mind that we as a people who are interesting and uh, who, uh, who want to be involved in a process is important for important for our lives need to be involved thank you very much much for your attention and i will be here for questions if 
they will be uh, raised for me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Suvad. And I must say that your English was just excellent. So we had no problem uh, understanding your messages. Um, I will leave the, the word now to, to Leila, uh, who has been our consultant for the country case study in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, she will present the key findings and conclusions. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am just starting the camera. I hope it's working. Um, well, first of all, I would like to um, uh, say that um, Suvad is the person who taught me a lot about the involvement and inclusion of persons with disabilities and peace building processes and and all other decision-making processes in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I'm glad uh, to share the floor today with him. Um, I would like to start the presentation uh, by saying that um, it was a very informative process right from the start. And uh, no matter how much one thinks one knows about uh, the human rights situation in a country, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, incredible to learn uh, about all these processes through the voices of organizations of persons with disabilities and uh, to understand the context actually from their perspective because uh, that's what matters after all. I will, not, uh, um, I will share now the screen for just a second to... Uh, start with the findings here. <clears throat> um, I will uh, briefly, briefly um, explain the process of the study because I think it's important for before we move to the key findings. Basically, we um, um, I engaged in this uh, study as part of the, 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 the larger global study that Ingela just explained. And uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, we started first with the mapping of all the existing um, key um, peace building processes in the country. And uh, we contacted uh, different international organizations and, uh, and uh, 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 civil society organizations, as well as uh, partner organizations of organizations of persons with disabilities to see um, uh, how we can uh, feed all this information into the main aims of the study, which uh, was uh, to assess and analyze the capacities, policies, strategies, and approaches on the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the existing peace building processes. Uh, that was the first stage. And the second stage was to gather and present the views and perspectives on the needs and interests, uh, interests of persons with uh, disabilities and their organizations and their constituencies. Uh, and to provide the recommendations to, uh, first of all, UN agencies, but also all other relevant national and international uh, organizations involved in the peace building processes. <coughs> So as I mentioned, we first conducted the mapping of existing data on the implementation of uh, international standards pertaining to inclusion of persons with disabilities, and then with the particular focus on the peace building initiatives. Uh, we divided the, the stakeholders into four groups. Uh, the first group was the UN agencies uh, offices in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, the second was international multilateral organizations. Uh, the third group was civil society organizations and, of course, organizations of persons with disabilities. Uh, in this process, uh, after gathering all the data, uh, what I've tried to do in order to get the key findings was to uh, conduct a, a triangulation throughout the process. So all the information gathered through the mapping and through the interviews with all the peacekeeping, uh, sorry, peace building um, actors in the country, uh, I tried to verify that information or to, to, to discuss that information with the organizations of persons with disabilities uh, in order to be able to find the, the, the to, to, to identify the key findings. Uh, 
When it comes to the country, uh, a lot of you, obviously all of you know that there was a, a very violent conflict in the period between 1992 and 1995 in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina that was ended with the Dayton Peace Agreement. Uh, following the peace agreement, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina also signed and ratified all the core international human rights treaties. As Suvad mentioned, also the, the, the convention related to persons with disabilities, but all other international human rights treaties. Uh, uh, and by doing that, committed to, to implement its provisions at the national level. Um, however, implementation challenges uh, include a fragile socio-political situation and very deep ethnic divisions that continue to exist in Bosnia and Herzegovina of today after two and a half decades of peace. Uh, what we can see a lot is, is uh, these ethnic divisions and socio-political fragile situation. We can see it particularly at the lo local level where we see uh, very deeply divided communities still, uh, wartime legacies and ethnic cleavages that continue to overwhelm all other cross-cutting issues, uh, including um, discrimination uh, of, uh, between women and men, uh, national minorities, persons with disabilities, and other vulnerable groups and individuals. Within this uh, context, we had many initiatives related to peace building. Uh, first of all, we have a very large international presence in Bosnia and Herzegovina, including uh, 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 with numerous efforts to prevent uh, a return to the conflict. Um, I, I will mention briefly uh, some of the most important ones. Uh, one of them is Annex 7 of the Dayton Peace Agreement, which uh, was supposed to uh, make sure that everyone returns to their pre-war homes. Uh, then we had many initiatives related to international justice, uh, including war crimes prosecutions at the ICTY uh, court in The Hague, following um, uh, taking over the war crime prosecutions at the national level uh, across the country. And then we had many institutional reforms. Recently, uh, UN agencies have been uh, implementing a program called Dialogue for the Future, and this for us was very interesting uh, in the context of inclusion of persons with disabilities, which I will mention uh, uh, later about. Apart from the UN, we also have uh, uh, a lot of other peace building initiatives in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, mainly carried out by the civil society community. Um, when it comes to the inclusion of persons with disabilities uh, in, in the peace building processes in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, the first finding uh, which creates a lot of challenges uh, in, the, in the realities of peace building is basically in absence of a comprehensive transitional justice reparations policy, the BIH authorities um, indirectly and politically tend to use social benefits for, meant for persons with disabilities caused by the war as a form of reparation. And this creates a huge uh, discriminatory practices between uh, this group and those who have non-war related disabilities. And uh, so uh, having in mind such legislative framework, uh, we tried uh, to analyze a little bit whether the situation is the same when it comes to the involvement of persons with disabilities in peace building processes, because if this is the legislative framework, then uh, uh, it is very possible that this happens at the, even at the, at the, not just at the decision making processes, but also in the, you know, community dialogues. Uh, and uh, yes, definitely one of the findings was, and which was also discussed a lot with the organizations of persons with disabilities, that uh, somehow if the peace building initiative is uh, based on the discussions uh, related to the war and dealing with this violent past, then it's somehow logical that active participants in these dialogues and discussions are those that actively participated in the war and that became um, that that became civilian or veteran war victims uh, during the war, uh, and this is uh, this is this is one of the findings uh, that that emerged. 
But apart from this, uh, it is important to mention that international organizations, um, particularly going back to the UN agencies, use a human rights-based approach and social cohesion as key elements of, of in, including persons with disabilities in their processes. Uh, the, the, the challenge with this approach, uh, no, the, the first, the positive side of social cohesion is the opposite of the first finding, uh, which is a very positive practice because with the social cohesion approach, uh, uh, there is a possibility for everybody to be included in the, in the, in, in the peace building process, uh, regardless of where, what their role was during the war, particularly when it comes to persons with disabilities. So this was a positive practice. The challenge with this approach that we found uh, analyzing dialogue for the future, the UN program, is that um, the, the, the spe special measures put in place throughout the implementation of this program uh, were intended for vulnerable groups. And while the persons with disabilities fall in the category of vulnerable groups in the Bosnia and Herzegovina society. What is challenging is that um, we know very well that, that um, there are certain preconditions that need to be met in order for me, uh, meaningful participation of persons with disabilities to take place. For example, uh, the information we received through focus groups and, and, and extensive discussions with organizations of persons with disabilities is, for example, they cannot participate in any initiative if the information about that initiative is not adapted to, to their needs. So uh, that, that is, for example, one challenge we found. Then uh, physical accessibility, then uh, design of uh, projects uh, is taking place without the involvement of persons with disabilities. So the designers of projects and programs are not informed and not uh, knowledgeable about specific needs um, uh, that are necessary to, to include persons with disabilities. And then when we get to the implementation stage, it turns out that there are lots of uh, logistical flaws that then are too late to address. Uh, for example, a uh, uh, couple of... Uh, couple of conversations we had among the organizations of persons with disabilities, uh, when it comes to uh, people with uh, visual impairment, uh, in order for them to participate at events, they need to come with assistance. So when uh, we do uh, budgeting during the project design stage, uh, we only count persons with disabilities that would participate at events, but we don't count the assistance. So when we get to the implementation stage, uh, we don't have enough budget to actually implement that, uh, that, that activity with uh, people with uh, visual uh, impairment. Uh, another example was that uh, people with disabilities are um, invited to events, but then there, there is no physical accessibility adapted to them. I mean, event, uh, venues that are selected for these events are not uh, uh, appropriate for people in wheelchair, for example, to come. And then either people with disabilities who are invited simply don't turn up or they turn up and then they face very uncomfortable situations where someone has to carry them upstairs to the first floor where the conference room is and, and so on. Uh, these are just a couple of anecdotal examples just to illustrate uh, th this finding. Another finding which we find very, very uh, important during this study is this actually happened in the induction phase uh, during our initial contact with the civil society organizations in order to find out which ones um, include persons with disabilities to analyze later the, the level of inclusion. Majority of civil society organizations contacted at that stage stated that they don't exclude or discriminate against any specific group, but they just don't have any specific strategies or programs with a specific focus on persons with disabilities in their peace building efforts. For us, this represented an important finding in itself because it in a way demonstrated the need to strengthen the focus on persons with disabilities across all national and international stakeholders in terms of 
uh, their capacity building and, and, and building expertise when it comes to meaningful inclusion of persons with disabilities. Uh, because another, just anecdotally, they, they would, uh, some of them would tell me that um, uh, they don't see any reason why they would have any specific strategy to include any vulnerable group. Uh, they, they basically never ever would deny uh, participation of anyone, which basically means that, uh, going back to the previous point, that uh, uh, in these initiatives, there are no preconditions met for meaningful full participation of persons with disabilities. Um, uh, the most interesting uh, part, I would say, the most informative for me, as I said at the beginning, was uh, the focus groups uh, held with the persons uh, with disabilities, with the organizations and their constituencies. Uh, for example, one of the perspectives, uh, I mean, the, the main perspective they told us from the beginning is that they feel that they're generally excluded from all gen uh, decision making processes in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and they see peace building as yet another process where they're generally excluded. And this um, was touched upon and addressed by uh, Suvad earlier, so I don't need to go uh, further into that, but I do feel the need to um, to support the argument that Ingela made earlier about this charity approach. Uh, because organizations of persons with disability is, uh, told us that the underlying cause for this uh, general exclusion from the decision-making processes is the misperception in society that being disabled means being either unwilling or incapacitated to participate in decision-making processes. So why would peace building be any different? Uh, in, in this regard. And another example I, I will put here is uh, uh, when I talk to the youth of, uh, of uh, youth members of organizations of persons with disabilities, uh, one of them told me that uh, the newly elected mayor in the municipality where she lives uh, had a very strong component on um, persons with disabilities in, in uh, in his pre-election campaign. So when he was elected, she wanted to meet with him for the first time as an activist. And uh, he started telling her about all the humanitarian aid that he prepared for persons with disabilities residing in, in the territory of his municipality. And she told him, I would prefer if you adapted the elevator that takes to your office uh, to us who are in a wheelchair so that we can meet on, on equal footing and, and discuss uh, the needs and the rights of persons with disabilities from the municipality. So this was a very powerful for me example of, of uh, showing this uh, charity and humanitarian approach to persons with disabilities rather than, um, than taking them as equal partners and discussing with them their needs. Uh, another thing that I think was very important in discussions with persons with disabilities was they said that um, one of them said, if we don't impose ourselves in peace building initiatives, no one will notice that we are not there. And this supports the argument of the importance of continuous empowering of civil society of persons with disabilities, which Suad also mentioned, uh, uh, that, uh, that it is very important uh, to, to continue empowering them because this is the only way to change the social narratives, which are completely wrong, which perceive persons with disabilities as a social category uh, that deserves charity. Um, apart from that, I touched upon earlier, and I will just uh, conclude here, that uh, um, in order to have meaningful uh, inclusion of, of uh, everybody in society, including persons with disability, is, is to have a broader definition of peace, in the, which opens space for general inclusion. Uh, basically, um, if we discuss um, uh, peace as uh, not just mere absence of war, but also uh, stability, uh, inter-ethnic trust building, universal human rights, rule of law, and so on, then there is space for everybody to have a say in, in building such a stable, peaceful society. Um, 
and and this uh, if this was the case this would also resolve the problem of this this uh, discrepancy in approach when it comes to uh, persons with disabilities that uh, have become disabled due to the war and those that haven't and um, i think uh, I, I will conclude with the with the with for me the most powerful thing which is uh, one of just yet another thing that i learned from suad uh, and he already talked about the universality of, of disability and uh, i found it fascinating that uh, the organizations of persons with disabilities in effect went through their own internal peace building process right after the war without the rest of the society even noticing without them even knowing that it's called peace building because they felt that because of this universality, uh, that the, the, the disability is universal and this is something that connects them. So as soon as they started encountering administrative and other problems after the war, they started contacting each other across ethnic entity lines, across ethnic lines, uh, and trying to find a common ground and help each other uh, you know, fight for their right. And, uh, and, and this is something that uh, I think uh, should be used widely by both the Bosnian society and other post-conflict societies as an example. And the last example that also fascinated me a lot was um, there was a lot of uh, conversation whether uh, the, the absence of meaningful peace building in Bosnia uh, two and a half decades after the war is due to the fact that society hasn't reconciled or that it's the political narratives in power that, uh, that, that prevent the stability and peace to, 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 to uh, come in. And uh, when we had discussions with the war veterans, they also showed us that through their ethnic, in, they have inter-ethnic sports activities. Um, they showed us that reconciliation is possible because they said if we can work together despite the fact that we actively participated in the conflict and became disabled due to the conflict then the mainstream politics could and should have reconciled by now uh, i will uh, end here because i'm running out of time but i will be uh, more than happy to answer questions and to continue the the, the, the discussions at the end of the presentation thank you uh, thank you, Leila. Uh, I can just quickly add that uh, um, the full report of the country case study um, can be accessed uh, through our website. And uh, the report includes also some case examples of the most positive practices identified among UN agencies and, and other international stakeholders. Um, because we, we actively at least try to identify the most positive project examples um, to learn from for the future initiatives. So now I will hand now we will turn the focus to the Sri Lanka case the country case study uh, and I will turn the word over to our uh, partner organization disability organization joint front. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank my right for giving me this opportunity to address you all. Uh, today it has uh, been presenting uh, the findings of this global study combining the studies of Sri Lanka and Bosnia. We were involved with the study conducted in Sri Lanka by MBF. We are uh, pleased with the initiative of my right on the inclusion of persons with disabilities in peace building, which was neglected in our context. Uh, here, I would like to share my experience of persons with disabilities related to the peace process in Sri Lanka and their unique issues. Um, so first, there is a there is lack of participation of persons with disabilities in national level programs in peace process. Uh, most of the discussion in the peace process were limited in the north and east areas uh, geographically, but uh, the disabled community was not part of it. Another one is uh, number, 
develop number of development projects, programs, dialogues, uh, strategies, action plans have been implemented related to the peace process in Sri Lanka. But we have no clear ideas how far we had been involved with the, those programs. Uh, and also we have no information whether the children and women with disabilities have been included into the educational programs as well as women's programs. Uh, we noticed large number of uh, people who were disabled not only due to war, but also due to birth defects and various illness and accidents. Uh, I would like to mention what extent uh, did the deaf community receive the information about the programs implemented under the peace process. Uh, as we are aware, the main objective of this study is to study on the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the peace process in Sri Lanka. Uh -huh. We see that uh, the peace peace process would not be just process, but it should be a process with the participation of citizens in development process of country. Therefore, this study is important because 8.7% uh, people with disabilities are living in Sri Lanka. Uh, this study has been gathered data uh, from UN agencies, civil society organization, DPOs, NGOs, and also uh, partner organization of my right to study how far they have been involved persons with disabilities in their peace building programs in Sri Lanka uh, as well as ex examine their policies related to this study topic the purpose of this study is to make suggestion on their policies and what they can in order to improve it so there has been number of researchers on the peace process in Sri Lanka, but our view is that research on people with disabilities is very limited. We heard that there were some uh, focuses on women with disabilities in the peace process, but it does not uh, representation of all disability categories. Uh, actually, we think that uh, most important part of this to show how the disabled community can contribute, contribute and involve with the peace building process leading to the development process of country. It is also important to send a clear message to the relevant parties or authorities on how to include people with disabilities in their future programs. Uh, as a DOJ president, our expectation is not to include people with disabilities as beneficiaries in this process, but engaging them in actually in the decision making process and a part of the national development process. Peace building is not um, uh, merely discussion on peace, but planning, implementing, monitoring and evaluating our inputs in the process towards nat national development. Uh, therefore, I hope that all of you who join with this discussion today will be able to gain an understanding of the importance of participation of persons with disabilities in the peace building process in Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for uh sharing your uh, important experiences uh, with us. Uh, I will hand over the word to Zoe, who is representing MDF Training and Consultancy, uh, who were our partners in conducting the country case study of Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, and, and thank you very much, uh, Rasanjali, for you know, not only contributing to uh, the research, but I think giving a very nice uh, summary uh, from the perspective of, you know, representatives and, and organizations of uh, people with disabilities. Um, so I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you see that on the full screen? 
Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so uh, I think just to start, um, you know, we we would like to reiterate, I think, uh, a lot of the uh, findings that Ingela briefly mentioned uh, it, during the introduction to this um, uh, to this presentation. Um, and I think also there are some very interesting parallels with uh, the findings from uh, Bosnia and, and, Her and Herzegovina. Um, yes. So just uh, to start with a brief note about uh, how we conducted the research um, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, we were a team of researchers um, uh, also involving experts uh, on disability uh, and peace building. Um, so we mostly used a qualitative method. We did, uh, you know, desk studies of uh, previous research conducted. Uh, we did interviews. Um, we, uh, there were some challenges uh, related to COVID-19 because uh, we were not able to uh, travel out uh, to all of the regions in Sri Lanka due to the COVID-19 outbreak and due to, um, uh, you know, travel restrictions uh, in the country. Uh, so we focused on uh, connecting with representatives of organizations um, who would be able to tell us their representative views uh, on the situation. Uh, so we were not able to reach the number of people we originally would have liked to, uh, but still we, we were uh, able to find uh, quite a lot of rich uh, narrative data, which we were able to use and triangulate um, uh, to come up with the conclusions. Um, so uh, reiterating the introduction that Ingela gave, um, we were not looking to do, uh, you know, an evaluation or an assessment or, you know, make a judgment about how well certain organizations or entities or the government have done uh, in terms of inclusion of persons with disabilities in peace building. Uh, but what we understood is this study is actually to identify and to share and to learn from, um, you know, successful practices and, and successful policies. Uh, so yeah, we were looking for, for those uh, to, to investigate and, and to learn from um, those uh, uh, good or uh, promising um, policies uh, or practices. Um, in Sri Lanka, the peace building priority plan was implemented from uh, 2015 until 2020. Uh, the 30 year civil war in Sri Lanka ended uh, in uh, 2011. Uh, so the peace building priority plan uh, is the main peace building, national peace building framework um, in the country, uh, which was implemented by uh, the United Nations, supported by the United Nations Peace Building Fund. Uh, and of course, the government of Sri Lanka. Um, so we uh, interviewed three different types of organizations in Sri Lanka, uh, you know, after uh, reviewing previous research, uh, which was done. Uh, we um, connected with UN agencies, uh, which were uh, conducting peace building um, initiatives or uh, uh, having the mandate uh, to do with peace building in Sri Lanka. Any other national and international stakeholders like bilateral or multilateral uh, projects um, or international or national or local civil society organizations um, which are uh, involved in, in peace and reconciliation um, across the country. Uh, and uh, which also included uh, people with disabilities um, uh, to some extent. Uh, we looked at whether they did that or not. Um, and then, of course, we looked at organizations of persons with disabilities um, and uh, the people that they represent um, as well. 
Uh, so uh, in terms of our uh, findings, uh, our first objective was to look at the United Nations uh, Peace Building Support Fund uh, UN agencies. Um, uh, this was this was key objective A, and to identify, you know, their best practices, their their challenges uh, with regards to inclusion of persons with disabilities um, in the peace building priority plan. Um, in general, uh, we found that uh, up until about a year and a half ago, uh, there has been no strong focus and no strategic approach to disability inclusion. Um, in 2019, of course, uh, the UN adopted uh, the disability inclusion strategy. So we saw uh, very recently um, some UN agencies starting to take a more strategic focus uh, on inclusion of persons with disabilities. Um, and, uh, you know, taking greater efforts uh, to uh, include that, you know, from the design phase um, of, of their projects. Um, so there were not many projects which took a very targeted approach to inclusion of persons with disabilities in the peace building uh, priority fund, um, peace building priority plan. Uh, or uh, the Peace Building Fund initiatives. Um, but uh, in general, these projects and programs did include uh, vulnerable groups or marginalized groups, uh, which did in fact include persons with disabilities. Um, but because they were not you know, a specific target group, uh, it means that we don't have data about you know, exactly how many people with disabilities were included in the projects or programs or whether or not they really benefited um, from these projects or programs or what effect uh, this this had on um, you know dispelling uh, you know discrimination or or you know effectively uh, including them in these uh, in these projects and programs um, so we, we thought that was quite uh, promising in general that there is now uh, a, a greater focus on doing this. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, you know there were, uh, even though it, it, it was not a targeted uh, focus area, there were uh, a few projects uh, which took a mainstreaming approach so far. And a couple of uh, interesting models where they did identify uh, that um, including persons with disabilities, you know, not as beneficiaries, not, not as like target groups, um, but actually as, as strategic um, development actors, as, as social agents uh, of, of change uh, within their communities. Um, and, and that was quite uh, interesting and, and innovative. Um, a few projects uh, had included additional provisions to help overcome barriers. Uh, for example, um, uh, yeah, allowing uh, assistance to uh, also uh, join, um, uh, you know, workshops or other activities uh, to support the persons with disabilities, um, even if it had not been, uh, you know, something that was specifically mandated in the projects. Uh, there were several projects which which uh, made some effort to do that. And another very good uh, practice or or a you know positive change. Um, which we observed within the UN uh, system in Sri Lanka um, is that uh, staff members uh, or resource persons who are themselves uh, having a disability or who are, you know, an expert or who are an advocate or an activist for disability inclusion. This kind of created quite some change and momentum in the UN system in Sri Lanka. 
um, a lot more focus and attention on this area and a lot more critical thinking about uh, you know how we can and uh, how can we can build this culture of disability inclusion in UN projects and programs. Um, so that is, is a positive change uh, which we observed. Um, however, UN organizations, of course, still face barriers and, and challenges, um, uh, especially once projects had been uh, approved and, and were already being implemented. Um, it was extremely hard for project teams to then go back and change uh, target groups or to change budgets to specifically include persons with disabilities. So even though there was, a, um, you know, an awareness and a desire to do this, uh, some projects and programs uh, are not able to uh, you know, specifically have tactics for, for greater inclusion um, until it comes to, you know, the next phase of programming. Um, and when there was no specific requirement from the donor to include persons with disabilities, it's very difficult to make it happen. And uh, then there is no, um, uh, no collection uh, of, uh, of, 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 specific data about disability inclusion. Um, the responsible government entity uh, for disability in Sri Lanka had changed. Um, at certain points, it was uh, difficult to identify uh, because disability inclusion is a um, cross-cutting issue across uh, several areas. Uh, it was a bit difficult to uh, identify exactly the government department or the ministry um, with which the UN should work. Um, and they found that on the national level, uh, there was not enough good data um, on persons with disabilities. Uh, and, and that was a challenge uh, for, for UN projects and programs because they work primarily with the government uh, and they work on the national level as well. Um, accessibility and communication barriers are one of the biggest challenges. They still exist. Um, you know, it's similar, I think, to what Leila mentioned, you know, finding venues which are accessible, you know, finding uh, qualified uh, sign language interpreters. There, there are very few in Sri Lanka. Um, so, you know, not only for physical uh, disabilities, but also um, communication, uh, non-visible difficulties, uh, it, it is extremely challenging for them to uh, overcome some of those, um, uh, you know, barriers to inclusion because there are not enough uh, resources um, in, in the general environment. Okay, uh, so the next uh, section in our study related to... Uh, so, hey, um, since we are running out of time, and maybe we should just skip uh, objective B and move to objective C so that we hear uh, the perspectives uh, from organizations of persons with disabilities. And then I think we have to request uh, those interested in knowing all the details of the country study to, to download the report, uh, sure. because uh, we only have 35 minutes uh, left in total. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think for um, the other uh, organizations, bilateral, multilateral projects, a lot of the findings mirror also the findings from the UN agencies. Um, yeah, as well, so that, that's fine. Um, from the perspective of organizations of persons with disabilities, um, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, Gala has uh, mirrored these, I think, in, in the global report um, that organizations of, of persons with disabilities reported that they were quite unfamiliar with this concept. Um, and in general reported that they were not included in, in national uh, peace building initiatives. Um, 
this kind of charity model uh, is still exists. Uh, in the country, there, there is a movement, a bit of a movement away from this approach, but this still poses, uh, you know, an obstacle to meaningful inclusion of persons with disabilities. Um, there was a, a difference uh, in terms of engagement according to the type of disability and, and also with gender. So for example, um, it, they observed that uh, people who are having physical disability, uh, it is, they have been included more in projects and programs by, you know, United Nations, by other civil society organizations or NGOs, by the government. Um, but people who have a non-visible form of uh, disability, for example, being deaf or blind, um, that uh, these people were not included as much. Um, and of course, there were a lot of barriers for women with disabilities. Um, it, it relates also to uh, social and cultural um, uh, barriers, which also exist, uh, especially in the war affected regions uh, of Sri Lanka. Um, yeah, communication remains a key challenge, uh, especially for those uh, uh, people who are affected by you know, non-physical disabilities. Um, physical accessibility is still a significant problem. Transportation in Sri Lanka, whether that's in the city or in the rural areas, um, access to yeah, buildings and venues, even, either you know, private or government uh, institutions as, uh, as well. Um, yeah, that, that is still very much a, a huge problem. Uh, there, people with disabilities face still a challenge uh, in accessing basic rights and, and overcoming poverty. And the, this is one of the, the most significant uh, and, and important things that um, the Organization of Persons with Disabilities reported to us that until these basic rights are met, it is very difficult for them to focus on, you know, uh, being involved in, in peace building, right? Um, yeah, that, that is still very much their focus area in terms of their advocacy efforts. Um, yeah. um, and uh, persons with disabilities are largely excluded from uh, public uh, institutions, state support, um, state mechanisms. Uh, and so these basic uh, services um, are, are also posing a barrier to uh, you know, having social protection um, and or being included uh, in, in other community uh, events uh, or community initiatives. Um, and persons with disabilities are still living with uh, injustices uh, from the war. Um, yes, and I think the recommendations uh, based on these findings were uh, incorporated into the global global level uh, recommendations, which I believe Angela will sh share. Thank you so much, Zoe. Uh, I, we just received a message from our uh, partner from UN Women, uh, Munduru. Uh, asking to be the next speaker because he has to leave for another meeting. So I will give the word to Munduru before I go through the recommendations. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Zoe, can you, would you mind stop sharing your screen? Fantastic. Sorry, go ahead. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Can, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the outreach. I'm particularly uh, interested, I was interested to listen to colleagues from the ground from both Sri Lanka and Bosnia Herzegovina. Um, both countries I covered in the past in my previous responsibilities and 
therefore they are very close to my heart personally as well and some of the realities are not unknown to me as well given that i had to work with partners on the ground and i think one thing is uh, very clear listening to the uh, presentations uh, which is part of the global study by my rights i just want to also congratulate the team for the study and the depth and some of the uh, challenges they identified are actually challenges that we are grappling with and i would not focus on only one single or a one form of multilateral bodies as well because even if you think about united nations or any other multilateral bodies or bilateral organizations they can be as ambitious as the national counterparts could be because in many countries they are in they sometimes are guided by the national priorities culture and the ambition and the scope of work as well and it reflects in the multilateral bodies much more because at the end of the day it is the member states wishes of the organization that carry forward the agenda so therefore if you are in a country which is not necessarily culturally and socially and economically sensitive of the more challenges of exclusion you would not see a fundamental shift in attitude and culture that goes back to when we deal with i'm just make uh, give an example ending violence against women uh, it doesn't happen just because there were one law or there is a one national or international body wants it to happen it's a collective effort of a national and subnational process so that's number one uh, i just want to also uh, raise the issues of peace uh, building process which is a big uh, undertaking because peace is not about only particular conflict setting and peace negotiation it is also includes it includes peace making peace building it includes peace consolidation and it is very much part of a broader rule of law aspect as well because in many countries you have conflict and then post conflict state rebuilding process happens but there are institutional practices that have uh, that were there the prior to the conflict and those practices remain some so, sort of intact so we have seen this time and again that there have been new buildings new uh, institutions are built up but the practices never change as a result you might have a coat of new paint, uh, paint but they didn't change the entire piece apparatus so that's the second point uh, third point i just want to highlight that listening to both presentation from sri lanka and bosnia herzegovina one thing is very clear that the challenges of inclusion challenges of accessibility uh, are larger than peace building process and therefore if you are in a country or in a society in a particular moment of time and you are trying to adjust the conflict uh, management and conflict setting and then transition into peace building process unless you changes the societal aspiration and ambition towards becoming a more inclusive society it doesn't change the participation aspect and that is that is critical now in even women we are of course as our my last uh, my previous speaker rightly mentioned that united nations and un agencies haven't done much uh, i completely in agreement with her assessment because this this has been a, a increasingly a new development for many agencies both national international and we have a lot of things more to do uh, particularly to ensure reasonable accommodation accessibility and inclusive approach to development now in the past we have seen that disability has been lumped together as part of the marginalized groups or disadvantaged group as we as you have also mentioned but we uh, we have also realized that that basically doesn't do justice to the uh, enormous potential that individuals display in the respective society and how can you connect that 
potential with the, what is happening in the society and the country. Now, we have sort of uh, in, in last one year, we did a study uh, looking at women, peace and security agenda and the rule of law agenda and how these agenda are inclusive or not um, inclusive. Now, this, this hasn't been a big uh, study we have done in six countries. And, and what the findings, some of these findings are informing us and we have published this uh, already. Some of the findings are telling us um, and also confirming some of the uh, findings that you are sharing from Sri Lanka and Bosnia Herzegovina. But I just want to, for the interest of time, I just want to share a little bit of perspective from the study because we looked at peace and security and rule of law aspect. And we recognize that the, the agenda is predominantly supply driven in most of the countries where if you look at who are the influential member of this sector in both peace and security and rule of law are Ministry of Defense, uh, Ministry of Interior, police, uh, border guards, and, and other intelligence and other, and other groups who are traditionally much more state-centric and they, they have their own respective mandate. And they're very much uh, pros in the sense that they're, they're keen to make sure that law and order ensured constitutional order is there. So the whole agenda of the civil society participation, participation of OPDs, participation of disabilities, women with disabilities, different groups. And most importantly, and I would say uh, importantly, because we also realized that- On your own, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, but we need to also leave uh, room for a question in, at the end. Sure. So if so you the could, last uh, point, uh, your, your right on point, your last point is the whole aspect of intersectional approach is uh, missing in this, uh, in this ball game. And intersectional is, of course, broader than only disability inclusion. But what we are increasingly seeing, and that is my last pitch here, is intersectional approach we need for budgeting. Also, international appro intersectional approach we need for programming. And what we are seeing in the countries and organization, we don't see the reflection of that intersectional approach in budgeting. We're also not seeing that approach when they build new program and provide opportunities for uh, different groups to participate in meaningful participation. So with that uh, note, I would just uh, thank all of you for your inputs from our end. And also want to um, make sure that if we could do something uh, very concrete follow up in those countries where you have done our, your studies and beyond where you haven't done, but we have done. And perhaps we can share experiences and draw par parallel and that would be a meaningful way of taking this agenda forward and perhaps uh, come up with one specific agenda in 2021. Thank you very much and over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to con continuing the discussion and collaboration uh, later during the year. Um, I will quickly also now share my screen again uh, to present the the main recommendations, but I have to go through them rather quickly so that we can have some room for uh, comments in the end. Um, so our recommendations are of course based on the gathered findings, conclusions, but also uh, on the identified best practices. So we have seen that uh, a few organizations already have taken a few of these steps. So then we know that it, it is possible to, to implement. Uh, so the first recommendation is to mainstream the rights of persons with disabilities into every uh, strategy and project um, in a similar way that organizations have treated uh, gender and gender mainstreaming and maybe also conflict sensitivity and environmental uh, climate change uh, because if you just leave it uh, either as a, a topic that you don't address at all or uh, a separate policy uh, then it tend to be uh, forgotten among the other important cross-cutting issues. Um, uh, to continue moving from charity-based model to human rights-based and twin-track approaches to disability inclusion meaning that you recognize persons with disabilities as active 
uh, stakeholders and experts on their respective um, uh, fields, rather than uh, viewing them only as uh, needs-based uh, uh, participants. Uh, to strength, strengthen uh, staff capacities and resources, we have seen that a few organizations have appointed specific resource persons or focal points who functions then, function then as experts within the organizations and can advise their colleagues uh, on these matters. Um, for donors uh, to require implementing actors to mainstream disability inclusion in their projects, and also, of course, make sure that there are sufficient uh, funds and budgets for, for this. Uh, and this was actually mentioned a lot uh, among the implementing actors because uh, as long as the donors do not request them, this it's difficult also to justify such costs or uh, within the, the project uh, grant applications. Uh, to strengthen advocacy and lobbying uh, and provide direct support to organizations of persons with disabilities. And this was specifically, uh, as you heard, emphasized by Suvad in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the same situation we have in, in all countries uh, where we work, uh, that um, organizations of persons with disabilities need a lot of capacity building uh, support. Uh, for the fields of peace building, democracy and governance, and also human rights, uh, to increase the co cross collaboration on the inclusion of persons with disabilities, because we have seen that certain sectors uh, have come a bit further also in, in this matter, and maybe that peace building is the sector that lag, lags behind the most, and actually that humanitarian actors are maybe a bit better at uh, including persons with disability, although not doing it. Um, uh, with a human rights-based approach, but rather through the charity model. Um, and then to work together with state um, uh, institutions uh, in order to uh, gather uh, data on uh, disability and also disaggregated data on gender, age, different types of uh, disabilities. And then finally, we also have a few recommendations directed to organizations of persons with disabilities, and that is to actively seek these opportunities, because uh, a finding, and especially in Sri Lanka, was that um, maybe organizations have not uh, taken these uh, active uh, decisions to become engaged, uh, rather focusing on, on other issues, which is understandable when you don't have your basic needs and rights met, but our advice is still to, uh, to seek uh, these opportunities. Um, where possible also to continue uh, uh, implementing your own initiatives, uh, even though if they are uh, small and, and not funded by these larger donors, uh, we have seen that uh, they have been uh, positive in terms of um, contributing to reconciliation and uh, increased uh, inter-ethnic uh, understanding and collaborations. And then uh, one of the recommendations from uh, organizations of persons with disabilities, not only in this study, but also in previous research, is the matter of having some form of disability checks, some kind of guidance for international organizations um, to assess their projects uh, against. And then a recommendation would be uh, for organizations of persons with disabilities to, all, uh, to develop these guidelines rather than having um, uh, other uh, stakeholders uh, preparing it. Um, so these are our main uh, recommendations. And um, we now need to open the floor for uh, the questions and comments. So um, the floor is now open uh, and it's maybe it's easiest if you raise your hand before start uh, speaking uh, and then Sandra can give uh, the word in, the, in a fairly uh, correct order. Yes, thank you Ingela. We've actually already had a question in the chat um, from uh, Keiko working with the UNDP. I don't know if Keiko, do you want the floor to, to raise a question? Otherwise I can read it and, and read your question. Hi, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is Keiko. And thank you so much all this presentation, especially for the case study. 
it is really grabbing me because I started working on inclusion for many years, but only last four or five years, I kind of see people panicking at headquarter level. We have to do something, we have to do something. But then sometimes I have a case, Donna is imposing for the country office to do more disability inclusion, which country office have no idea how they can do it. So it is my question, how we can be, all of us can be held accountable ensure all our field office people have been trained, understanding, and then taking the lead on the inclusion in their own ongoing project, not only the new project. Plus, uh, we should be at a great recommendation all of it, but how we can transfer those recommendations to the annual target, and then how could we all head accountable for our annual achievement for our social agent, for our beneficiary? Back to you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. Ingrid, would you like to respond to the question? Oh, you're on mute. So, so the question, uh, if I understood it correctly, is how we can become better at uh, monitoring and reporting on the issue. Did I understand it correctly? Well, not only monitoring and reporting, maybe the lack of the data is a first step. Yes, um, yeah. Uh, providing staff training plus disability budgeting, for example, like agenda budgeting happened in the past, but yeah. disability inclusion have a much narrower target, probably starting removing from the barrier, which can be easily done with a small budget. So we mm. can encourage the agency to start taking a small step by annually, not talking about five-year strategy, mm. but how could we help the field office to actually start doing something? Thank you. Uh, well, I think that when it comes to uh, budgeting and staff capacity and all of this, I think that it's uh, at the UN level should be guided by the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy, which has uh, all of these um, areas uh, addressed. And then we have seen also that there has been a, a first voluntary reporting against this uh, strategy this year. And most UN agencies uh, reported their um, uh, achievements as kind of off track. So most uh, agencies, they recognize that they need to do much more on, on this issue. And when we spoke to you, um, I think it was you and the P and also the, the Peace Building um, uh, Bureau, uh, we uh, heard uh, an idea of having a kind of markers for projects and programs in a similar way as gender. And that would also increase the overall focus on disability inclusion, because um, if you don't have these uh, requirements, uh, uh, it, it tends to be forgotten. So that was a main recommendation. And I think that the, at least at the UN level, uh, you, there are you know, positive um, developments in the di right direction. And then as we also said that CSOs seem to be lagging uh, behind in, in, in this, development. Thank you both for that. Um, and both a, a good question and, and good response. Um, we now have another question from Kasunjit. Um, are you with us? If so, please unmute your microphone if possible. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, congratulations to my right uh, for the great initiative. Uh, uh, just, uh, just have one question. Uh, this um, uh, the one, one uh, over, overarching aspect that was uh, reiterated in both the reports, both, both the reports, both in Sri Lanka and in uh, uh, Bosnia, is the fact that uh, the DPOs felt, OPD felt that uh, they uh, they are not uh, included in the discussion uh, from the UN side. So uh, was was this? Due to a capacity issue, was or was it uh, uh, was it uh, 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 have the have, have was it because the the lack of uh, the UN system uh, knowledge about UN how the UN system works uh, and uh, if at all any uh, best practices that the OPDs adopted in order to uh, uh, mitigate that issue uh, that has come across uh, during your studies. 
I would like to know a little bit more about uh, those aspects. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps uh, Zoe and, and Leila could uh, answer this question based on the country case study findings, right? Yeah, uh, thank you, Kasunjith. Uh, I think that's a that's a very interesting question uh, because I I have also been thinking about this, uh, so I may not have you know a, a completely satisfying answer for you. I was also wondering what the what the root cause uh, of this is. Um, whether I mean we we didn't come to the conclusion that the UN did not consult uh, persons with disabilities or, or their organizations. But uh, perhaps within the disability sector, not every single organization felt that they had been reached, right? And, and even for um, our research, uh, it was also difficult to create the same one. I think one of the recommendations that we had at the end of the Sri Lankan study was to create greater coherence within the disability sector because um, actually some uh, OPDs were actually not aware of other OPDs working in other regions of Sri Lanka or working, you know, in the same province, but working on a maybe slightly different uh, thematic area. Um, and so there I mean, we found that there was also kind of a lack of awareness about other organizations working on disability in, in some cases. Um, and perhaps, you know, one of the things that we thought to do was to recommend, uh, you know, greater um, collaboration within the sector to promote, you know, greater awareness uh, about, uh, yeah, other organizations, what they have been involved in, um, and to, uh, you know, collaborate going forward uh, for some of the other initiatives. Um, so it, it may not be, you know, 100% of, of the solution, uh, but um, maybe something uh, in, in there. Yeah, I, I don't know if Leila has, has some other thoughts on that. Um, yes, um, I think I mentioned uh, during the presentation that the key issue uh, that was identified during our study in Bosnia and Herzegovina was the fact that uh, the preconditions for the meaningful inclusion of persons with disabilities are generally not met. That coupled with the fact that there is a general misperception that persons with disabilities are counted as social category. Uh, recipients of aid rather than empowered equal citizens. Uh, and then the first point I mentioned, the fact that the preconditions uh, are not met, uh, I'm speaking generally now, is linked with what Ingela just said in the recommendations, which is that uh, it is very difficult for a civil society organization to secure additional funds to meet all the technical preconditions to ensure the meaningful inclusion of persons with disabilities if the donors are not uh, putting this as a requirement or at least as a, as a tolerant factor for additional funds. And I think between these two points, uh, somewhere in between these two points, uh, there is an answer, at least when it comes to the Bosnian study. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you very much. And in terms of, in terms of uh, one more thing, uh, in terms of the colleague who asked uh, whether UNDP systems, uh, if, I, if he, she, he or she can reach out to me, so, because I am also working with UNDP system, uh, I'm uh, happy to help out in finding out more details about how the office system works uh, in okay. terms of disability inclusion. Thank you very much. Just wanted to- uh, Thank you, Kasunji. Uh, yeah. All right, uh, next on our list of speakers, we have uh, Jaran Alfredsson, and then after that, we have Fon from Cameroon. Uh, so Jaran, please go ahead. Um, and you are speaking through sign language interpretation, if that, that's correct. Yes, yes, we can hear you. 
Hej alla. Tack för en fantastiskt fin rapport och presentation idag. Tack så hemskt mycket. Jag har besökt både Bosnien, Herzegovina och Sri Lanka många gånger och kan bara bekräfta att det ni säger. Nu sitter jag här och funderar lite just när det gäller Bosnien, Herzegovina situation. Nu finns det här Dayton-avtalet. Dayton-avtalet. Och då är det ju maktbyte var, var nionde månad. Hur påverkar det här eh, organisationen för personer med funktionsnedsättning? Just när det gäller lag och rätt och sådana och villkor. Kommer de upp så att det blir jämställt eller eh, går det att genomföra den här typen av arbete eller är det alltid ett steg fram och två steg tillbaka? Tack, det är min fråga. Men tack så mycket för en fin rapport. Thank you Göran. I don't know if perhaps if Leila want to comment or, or Ingela. <laughs> I think Leila is the best, best uh, to answer I, this question. Thank you, Joran. Yes, uh, but thank you. I think I had a, a problem with the translation and I'm not sure I understood the ninth month uh, issue related to the date and peace agreement. If you could just clarify, please. Sorry, Joran, would you like to clarify? Seems to have lost connection. Just ja, det brukar ju vara så att Dayton-avtalet, då är det i en region så i Västern, så, så, så är det en, en grupp som äm, styr. styr i nio månader och sen byts den här gruppen efter nio månader. Eller har det systemet förändrats? Jag kanske inte har hängt med. Tack. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, I th uh, you are referring to the tripartite presidency where uh, in fact, instead of having one president, we have three members of the presidency. Each one of them has to belong to a particular ethnic um, group in order to, to sit in the tripartite presidency. And then they rotate um, in, in, in the sense of who is chairing the presidency. Uh, fortunately to say, uh, during the study, even though I put these preconditions in place during the induction study, I was uh, amazed at the fact how the organizations of persons with disabilities operate among themselves beyond ethnic divisions. So yes, uh, to answer your questions, uh, question, legally, constitutionally, that rotation system is in place, not just in the presidency, also in the National Assembly, the parliament, uh, uh, in terms of equal ethnic representation. But when it comes to uh, uh, organizations of persons with disability, ethnic divisions are merely visible. Thank you for that, Leila. Joran, would you like to comment anything on, on Leila's response? Are you happy with the, the response to your question? I have a little tillägg. Thank you so much for the answer. I have a follow-up question. The jobbar. Lyckas de med sitt arbete trots den här eh, Rotation. rotationen i ledarskap? Tack. Um, organizations of persons with disabilities uh, need a lot of support in terms of empowerment generally and in including uh, peace building initiatives. But uh, to my knowledge, the, 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 the ethnic 
uh, representation in the decision making bodies hasn't affected them to, to any extent that is significant for the study. Thank you, Leila. All right, I know that we are almost out of time. Uh, do we have time for one more question, Ingela, before we conclude? Uh, yes, of course, because uh, Fon uh, yes, has Fon also has commented here in the chat and, and yes. we should hear uh, his exactly. questions. Fon, please take the floor and unmute. Yeah, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Uh, I want to say I'm grateful for this opportunity. Uh, this is exactly what we need as, first of all, persons with disabilities and youth leaders for other people with disabilities. I am a victim of conflict. I am also a leader for rehabilitation of those who are affected by conflict. That is those who were born with conflict, were born with disabilities who are now trapped in conflict and uh, those who have acquired disabilities due to conflict so i have uh, some questions and i have some proposals to make first of all i want to ask a question that is it that the activities related to persons with disabilities and inclusive programs are not at the level of the United Nations. I'm saying this because we find it very difficult to have specific uh, budgets or interventions directed to peace building among persons with disabilities at the level of the United Nations. Uh, is it that it is not existing or is it that it is dormant on papers? Okay, my second question is, uh, I want to find out how do we tackle uh, victims of violence into peace building? When I talk of victims, I mean those who have acquired disabilities due to conflicts, how do we use them as the immediate negotiators, the immediate mediators in terms of mainstreaming uh, peace building and disabilities? Those are two solid questions because uh, those are some areas which, according to my few work here in Cameroon, as a victim of violence and as a person with disability, I was always treated like uh, somebody who should be called when they are sharing rice, somebody who should be called at the UN the office where they want to share food. But I was the most traumatized and uh, other persons with disabilities are the most affected I talk of people with impediment, I talk of all forms of disabilities. Uh, we've had, we, because we work generally with all those with impairments in mainstreaming mm -hmm. uh, disabilities and peace building. So, Thank you, uh, Fon. Uh, we will try to answer your questions since we have already passed uh, uh, two o'clock. Uh, I will try to answer your first question and then I think that maybe Leila is better place to answer the second question since she I was, was going looking... to propose the same. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> so on the answer to your first question is yes, it is correct that um, and this is what we've been discussing for two hours here that uh, UN agencies and other international stakeholders have traditionally not been good at including persons with disabilities in peace building. And it is very difficult to find these positive uh, exceptions and it's coming more and more in, in the most recent years. And in our study, we have examples from Lebanon and Ukraine and Sri Lanka and Bosnia and Herzegovina with a few examples of how UNDP and also uh, IOM have started working um, with these issues in a better way. So uh, from those case examples, we hope that uh, other UN agencies and other international organizations, and maybe also those who would like to partner with the UN uh, can be inspired and continue uh, moving in, in that uh, direction. So. Uh, I'll let uh, Leila answer your, your second question. May I, may I also oh, add uh, oh. something after Leila? Suvad is speaking. Sure, 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 of course. 
Of course. Um, thank you, um, Fon. Um, I would like to comment from my perspective as a human rights activist in Bosnia and Herzegovina for many years, but I'm sure Suad is more pleased to give more details. Uh, when it comes to victims of war, uh, there have been many initiatives to address uh, uh, the, the, the issue, uh, as I mentioned, and especially international organizations have put a lot of efforts into uh, creating a dialogue between um, different uh, uh, ethnic groups, uh, civil, civilian war victims. But this is precisely what our study showed as problematic and challenging because if we have the legal framework which um, uh, makes a, a clear distinction between civilian war victims war veterans and persons with disabilities that haven't um, uh, got their disability due to war, meaning that there is some sort of preferential treatment. And this was also uh, defined and identified by the UN committees for human rights, different committees for, for um, different human rights treaties. Then we have a, a, a challenge in peace building initiatives because there, uh, somehow naturally, every time there's a peace building initiative, the ones who are invited for a dialogue are uh, victims of war. And then you have a large group of persons with disabilities who are not directly affected by the war, but their disability comes from other causes that are left totally outside of these initiatives. I can give you an example of myself, you know, having worked in uh, human rights areas in Bosnia for the past 20 years, when I was in charge of one of those big peace building initiatives, I was the first one who logically went after civilian war victims and war veterans thinking that they need to get together, they need to talk, they need to see that they're all victims and they need to deal with the past. And I totally omitted and completely forgot about this large population of people who are also affected by the war, even though the cause of their disability is not the war. Okay. Uh, thank I you. Thon, think... uh, we will give uh, the final words now to Suvad, who will also continue answering your question. And then after that, we unfortunately, we need to end uh, the, the meeting. But we can continue also the discussions uh, by email afterwards. So Suvad, please uh, go ahead. F thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, will be, uh, I will be short. There are uh, two preconditions uh, to change uh, approach to our different stake, uh, from different stakeholders toward uh, disability issue and people with disability. One is uh, uh, to change attitude or to change model of approaching the, uh, to the disability issue. And uh, the, the, the example gentlemen give to us mention is a typical uh, uh, charity or humanitarian approach. Uh, and what we need to learn how to, 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 uh, to promote and advocate for uh, our rights based on the human rights and the inclusion model. And second, uh, what exclude disability society, individuals and organizations from peace building process is uh, knowledge about transforming uh, messages or uh, our experience into the uh, policies on such level. What we need, we need to, to become recognized as a body is uh, politically acceptable to uh, different international or bilateral donors. That's not case now with the, with, with the uh, organizations and people with disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Suvad, uh, for your comments and, and inputs. Uh, do we have any final words, for example, from Jesper before we uh, end the meeting? Yes, I'd like to make a short comment. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, today 
um, local organizations with persons with disabilities from, from the different countries have participated both when the reports were made and in today's launch. And let me say that from Sweden, there would be no or at least very little support to these organizations uh, had it not been for the support from my rights member organizations, some of which are, are present today. My right has been responsible for the reports, but uh, our member organizations are the ones who are responsible for the organization to organization support. And related to this, I think it was made clear by all of today's contributors that inclusion is not only about being invited and about accessibility, it is also about having the capacity to contribute. Very often, I think that CSOs, civil society organizations are expected to turn up and contribute when never invited, but without a long-term and sincere support to capacity building, this may not be possible. Uh, so I really hope that this part of the whole picture is both seen and taken into account by, by everyone. So with these words, I want to end just adding my sincere gratitude to all participants, those who have made presentations, those who have asked questions, and those of you who have been present listening. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.